So we're just on our first slide. I hope you're all okay and you can hear me. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of you are sharing the screen. So one of the things that I want to start off with by saying is um, that TB is a very complicated disease. It's not black and white. And so there's variants of gray. And so what we'd like to do is kind of arm you with a toolkit of weapons to fight TB. And so these are the series that we're going to look at. Um, and so in terms of what we're doing provincially with our strategic uh, plan, this is um, to support our stakeholders to, to work with tuberculosis. This is the overview of uh, what we've kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to look at uh, your learning objectives, and um, so that you'll be able to actually diagnose, t uh, look at what are the um, parameters, what are you looking at, how do we diagnose it, what's latent TB infection. One of the things that Lynn and I will focus on is um, there's a lot of um, concern uh, with the clients that we work with. There's, you know, mistrust, there's barriers, because we actually can't, and we as in healthcare workers have had issues kind of identifying latent TB infection and active TB disease, the, a, the language. So we're really going to work through that so then when we provide educations to the people that we work for, uh, that information dissemination is going to go well. So um, just to point out this particular page, um, that when we're looking at DSTs, we're actually talking about drug sensitivity testing and not um, the um, uh, decision support tools. And then when we're talking about the PHMRL, we're talking about the BCCDC lab. So to, to clarify. So, so uh, TB is uh, an infectious disease and um, the bacterium is called mycobacterium tuberculosis and it usually attacks the lungs. If left untreated, it can be fatal. Uh, so typically only cases with respiratory forms of TB disease could be infectious and there are exceptions that we'll touch on shortly. And so if the TB organism is fully sensitive, it is curable. Um, so 80% on the next slide, 80% of uh, TB disease affects the lungs. So that's what you call your respiratory TB, typically contagious prior to treatment. Um, and so non-respiratory TB are droplet nuclei. They could be released under some circumstances, i.e. a wound with active TB, a dressing change that is uh, undergoing um, transition. 24% of these cases are in Canada. And um, another sample example of how droplet nuclei can be released would be through manipulation of uh, processing of tissue in the hospital or the laboratory. So when you're doing wound care. Um, so for tip number one, it is possible to have respiratory and non-respiratory TB disease at the time. So non-respiratory TB disease is also what we call extra pulmonary disease. Uh, always, always, when you have a case of, in, of TB disease that is extra pulmonary, please obtain sputum specimens so that we can rule out pulmonary involvement. So always think TB and um, our go-to test is the sputum. So this next slide simply shows you the areas of the body where TB can be located and just so that you know there is no area of the body that TB will not access because it can go anywhere and everywhere in the body. So non-respiratory TB disease, the example here is uh, peripheral TB lymphadenitis. Uh, this um, cervical nodes are the most often affected under TB lymphadenitis. It's important when assessing um, other areas of TB, that if you're listening to a client and they're complaining of swelling or pain in other areas of the body other than what you're interviewing them for, treating them for, pay attention. Maybe there's TB in other areas of the body as well. So um, you're just thinking of TB assessments for other potential TB sites as well. Our, our uh, philosophy is if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's TB. It's probably a duck. Um, and so, so, Lynn, um, how would we um, um, access those sites? What would we do to um, diagnose uh, TB in, 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 in another site outside the lungs? So if we're not doing an x-ray. Well, you need tissue specimens, you need sputum samples, uh, CT scans, that kind of thing. Sometimes somebody will be asked for a biopsy if we, get, we need to do that and get a tissue sample. So we're kind of going to move on. And so how common is TB? This is YVR. This is people coming in. It's a very busy um, airport. We kind of want to look at, in terms of 
uh, we kind of focus locally. We kind of look at what's happening in DC. But the drivers of what's happening with TB um, have it's the global picture. And so these are some of the global numbers, especially around MDR and um, uh, extremely drug resistant TB. So we want to be mindful of what's happening globally and then we can look at um, uh, what's happening locally because in terms of our cases of uh, TB, it's the uh, foreign board that's driving the TB in, in, in BC. So if you look at the Canadian picture, about 4.7 per 100,000 uh, in the average population, in the Canadian born population, 1,500 cases um, in Canada. And if you look at BC specifically, these are 2001 rates. We've got, uh, you know, higher uh, case rate, uh, 5.9 per 100,000. And generally, over the last 10 years, we've actually averaged about 300 cases. And again, where our cases are, 17% about um, is in the First Nation Aboriginal population, and about 73% is, is within the foreign-born. And when we look at those, obviously, China, India, the Philippines as, a, as an example. So for tr TB transmission, um, TB must be aerosolized to be infectious. And the droplet nuclei that transport the TB infection is usually inhaled by, by aerosolization. Uh, and so when a person coughs, sneezes, sings, shouts, which I do a lot of at home, <laughs> TB germs are passed into the air in the form of droplet nuclei. For instance, Nash and I are sitting beside each other now, and she, her being the shy individual that she is, she's talking a lot today. So what we do is, let's say I had active TB disease, Lynn and I are hanging out, I'm actually producing bacilli in the air because I have a positive smear and it's been PCR'd, we're going to talk about this so the language is familiar, um, she's breathing in the TB germ. So we're going to look at that scenario throughout this uh, lovely conversation. So for transmission of the droplet nuclei, uh, four factors actually determine the likelihood of transmission for MTB. Uh, first one being uh, the number of organized organisms being expelled into the air. Uh, and if you look at the picture, you can see that some of the organisms that are falling to the ground, those are actually larger organisms, whereas the ones up top in the red on your screen are smaller organisms. They actually stay in the air for up to six hours, which is a significant amount of time. Uh, so the concentration of organisms in the air determined by the volume and space and its ventilation, the length, length of time an exposed person breathes the contaminated air, and the immune status of the exposed individual. Um, as I mentioned, um, ventilation or air conditioning, fans, that kind of thing, can also, shared air, can also um, transmit the organism from place to place. So if you're looking at, in a perspective of contact investigation, if you're looking at a person that lives uh, in a basement of a home uh, and they have shared air, forced air heating, forced air, air conditioning, these drop in nu nuclei can actually travel on those air currents. So something to bear in mind when we're doing our assessments for contact tracing. Again, it just gives us an idea uh, why we're asking what we're asking because of the, this, how TB works. So generally, very few people who are exposed to infectious TB disease become infected with TB bacteria as a result. So it's important to encourage treatment for individuals with latent TB infection. So we want to make sure we look at those at risk or those who have been identified as latent TB infection, and we want to uh, be able to uh, treat because TB is totally curable, preventable. So we're going to look at, Lynn has kind of mentioned these uh, previously around transmission. So again, with the concentration of the nuclei, how, how infectious are you? So when we look at the GAFI count, you'll get a lab result and it's plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. That's going to tell you how infectious they are. In terms of the environment, so Lynn and I are hanging out. I have active TB disease. I'm smear positive. We're hanging out. Um, let's say at the ice hockey ring, watching the Canucks lose, you know, our, the environment, take a look at that. We're in a single room occupancy partying because Lynn and I are partiers. The exposure, the environment is going to be different. Um, in terms of the, the, the point to the physical proximity in the case, we want to remember who we're talking to and the circumstances of their communities. When it, let's say within First Nation communities, lots of kinship networks, lots of um, 
inter-multi-generational families. So if you come over to the Dalla household, lots of people coming in and out. I've got my mom there. I'm, I may have my aunties and uncles. So it's really important to make sure that there, that context in terms of the exposure because of uh, um, the risk of transmission. Um, who's in that room? Are they kids? Are there kids under five? Are there immunosuppressed there? And then the other, the other thing is the virulence of the TB bacteria. So we know in terms of, in terms of the Kelowna outbreak, uh, there's some resistance to low-level INH, and it's a very virulent uh, strain of TB, so we would really push um, prevention therapy if they were actually uh, looking at latent TB infection and obviously discounting um, active disease. Again, we're looking at, Lynn and I are hanging out in a room, transmission. You have to, have to inhale the TB germ. As uh, Lynn said, it could be in the air for a while, but once it hits the surface, it dies. So TB germ is quite smart. It goes into your alveoli, kind of settles in your upper lung there, and then it actually uses your microphage and actually surrounds it. It actually uses your immune system to survive. It's really quite interesting. So this is kind of how we're looking at latent TB infection. So if the person has been around somebody who has had active TB disease, they're infectious, they breathe it in the TB germ, the microfragile has surrounded it, and now we're looking at latent TB infection. And as, as within this slide would indicate, um, approximately 5% of those people who are breathing in that TB germ will break down with disease, and those factors, again, Children under five have a 40% risk. Immunosuppressed people will have a risk. And if you're HIV positive um, and you're not being treated with antiretroviral and you have um, ident been identified as having latent TB infection, you have a 7 to 10% risk annually. And so you eventually will break down with TB. So know who you're talking about. Know the environment. Know what sort of TB bug we're working at. And that kind of will help you in terms of the diagnostic stuff and which which arsenal, which toolkit to use so in terms of TST, in terms of um, AGRA, and x-rays. And we're going to be talking about this uh, further on. And so again, primary disease. If you look at what we're talking about here is who breaks down. And so um, we're looking at um, who can develop a, a TB with the risk factors that I just, just spoke about. Obviously, we're really worried about kids less than five and immunosuppressed. The highest risk of after you breathe in, in a TB germ, you've been in contact with Nash, she has TB, so now Lynn is worried. She's like, well, what do I do? So your, your greatest risk, your 5% risk of breaking down with TB, if everything else is equal, within the two to three years, you have a 5% risk, right? And so that's where we get that number. Now, this is presuming that Lynn is healthy, everything's going well, there's no other uh, comorbidities or risk factors, all right? And so tip number three, what we want to make sure, and we've talked about that in terms of um, contact tracing, if there is a child who ha um, has been identified as the, the case, um, they are not going to be the source case. Children, really they're low risk to actually being able to spread the disease because as Lynn said you have to be able to aerosolize it it has to get into the air and then you have to breathe it in and usually what happens is the kids are actually around somebody who's had active TB and they breathe it in so we want to make sure that we do reverse contact tracing this was very much true of, of what happened in Port Alberni our first case that come up was a kid and then we found uh, who actually infected the child or who actually transmitted TB to them so as Nash just stated, individuals have a 5% chance of getting primary TB disease within the first two to three years after contact with the source case. The other 95% who have had contact with an infectious TB case will develop latent TB infection or LTBI. So in terms of language and education for clients, LTBI is used to describe a sleeping or dormant TB infection, but they do not have TB disease. So I'm finding myself that I spend a lot of time on the telephone with contacts explaining the difference to them. So I think there's a huge opportunity for education around latent TB infection for the clients that we're serving. So a person um, infected with TB bacteria or LTBI um, are symptomatic, uh, no symptoms, 
they don't have any symptoms of, of current TB disease. Uh, their clinical exam chest x-rays are usually normal. Uh, no bacteria in their specimens, for example, in, example, their sputum specimens, and sometimes it might even be a, a tissue biopsy of some kind. Um, uh, their skin test is uh, usually positive, or their blood test, their eye can be positive, indicating TB infection. Um, it's really important to stress that this is not a case of TB disease for your clients, but TB infection. And you're likely going to have to repeat this just a few times until people grab on, grasp the idea of what the difference is between latent TB infection and TB disease, because there is such um, a huge stigma associated with TB. People only hear TB and they immediately associate that with disease and think that that's what they have. And so uh, just an example, we've all seen this as somebody comes into the clinic, they've got a positive skin test and automatically people are assuming that here's a case of TB. And so we still see that. So this is kind of one of the take home messages is knowledge is power. Um, educate the, the people that you are going to skin test. Um, tell them why you're doing what you're doing. These are some of the no-brainers, but we're still seeing that there is um, that misinformation in terms of of uh, TB that then creates a barrier for people accessing services. Okay, so clients with um, uh, TB, LTBI uh, need treatment to prevent TB disease. So treatment is preventable, so we give the medications for latent TB infection. Uh, it is a voluntary, not a mandatory program, and it is essential to controlling and actually eliminating TB disease. The World Health Organization actually recommends direct absorbed, uh, absorbed, direct observed preventative therapy or DOPT uh, for latent TB infection because it does increase patient adherence and decreases risk of progression to, act, uh, to active TB disease. We also do DOT for active TB disease as well. Um, so for the post-primary disease, um, TB bacteria actually, when it wakes up, it, we call it reactivation, which often uh, can manifest years after initial infection, and it can be pulmonary or extra-pulmonary. Again, 95% of uh, people in contact with active uh, infectious TB disease um, can have continued late latent TB infection, but then five, the 5% 5 who go on to develop reactivation of post-primary uh, disease are the ones that we're targeting. Uh, this is more likely to occur in individuals uh, with latent TB infection who have developed comorbidities after they've been infected with the, the latent TB uh, mycobacterium. So comorbidities include diabetes, malnutrition, HIV, AIDS with a low CD4 count, um, children under the age of five, um, elderly people with an, uh, a waning immune system. So that's just some of the population that you may see. So just a review. Latent TB infection, you have the TB germ in your body, you're not going to feel sick, you're not contagious, uh, it's totally preventable, it's totally uh, treatable. Uh, TB, TB disease, you have the bacteria in your body, it's active, it's multiplying, you can be sick. Um, we're going to go through the signs and symptoms, um, and if you have a cough, um, you know, always get sputums. Again, almost always it's curable. We want to make sure, um, you know, we're looking at um, the drug profile, and we're kind of talking about that. So really important to know the difference between latent TB infection and active TB disease, and using that language with um, our uh, populations that we work with. Really what's important here and what we want to stress is that lovely 939 that's on the left of your uh, screen there is really our go, it's, it's our main clinical assessment page. That's our client. And so you really, the, the more thorough you fill it out, the better that we can actually make a diagnosis of, because all of that information um, really helps. So TB, as I said, is, is um, not black and white, it's gradients of gray. And it's like pieces of the puzzle. We want to know what's happening with their history, what's happening with their symptoms. Are there a contact? Are there form born? Is there things around social determinants of health that would make uh, some um, determinations? So it's just not one piece. And this is the 939 that we really want you to, to be able to, to fill. And in terms of the number three, we'd actually like to 
um, add sputums onto that. So think TST, AGRA, and sputum. Um, and then we're going to go into each one. And so the health history. Um, it's really important that we uh, look at uh, review signs and symptoms because then it will then prompt you to uh, go into what am I going to do. So they have signs and symptoms. They have a pre previous positive skin test. I'm going to give them an x-ray. They have a productive cough. I'm going to do a sputum. So really, um, really make sure that we look at that. Um, again, signs and symptoms of TB. Think TB um, and, and make sure that, um, like we talked earlier, it's a multi-organ system that you can occur anywhere. So uh, look at, um, as Lynn had said, um, you know, uh, if we're thinking TB and they have some swelling or sight pain, that we would be looking at that as well. So basically what we really want you to do is use your clinical judgment and use that, that wonderful extra sense that we've all built up over time. If you get a sense that there's something not quite right or you're thinking maybe this individual may have TB, get a sputum specimen, get it sent away. Um, easy enough to do. Do it when they're right there in front of you. A bird in the hand is worth a million in the bush, in my opinion, when it comes to TB. So get that sputum sent out to us and we have uh, a head start on, on TB. So we want to look at symptoms when we are looking at TB disease. We've got fever, we've got night sweats, fatigue, weight loss, loss of appetite, again, pain. Um, and so specifically in and around the, the pulmonary TB, shortness of breath, chest pain, cough. So we want to make sure we get, we get sputums. And in terms of, uh, we can't stress enough that um, we're a team. Uh, we all work together to, to provide services to the communities we work with and we work for. So um, if there is, uh, we're always going to back you up in terms of your clinical practice and your rationales. We're here as a team. So you can call anybody at TB Control and have that discussion. Look at IFIS, see if there's information in the, in the computer regarding some history or so forth. So it's, it's, it's important that we actually work together and, and um, um, look at providing that. And again, to reiterate, if there's res respiratory symptoms um, and we're thinking active TB disease, get a sputum, get a stat sputum. Uh, our recommendation is that get that stat sputum, give the, the client two to go, um, and um, we'll then process that. Um, so when you're obtaining the health history on, on a client, you definitely want to do your signs and symptoms review. Uh, find out if there's any previous TB exposure or if they've had a previous history of TB. Um, people can be uh, extremely uh, poor historians given the right circumstances, especially if you're querying TB on them. They're, they're likely going to have all that information just fly out of their head, just like we do when we go into a doctor's office without our list. So if we're unsure, uh, if you're unsure um, about the information on this client, please give us a call. We'll check our database and uh, give you support in any way we can with that because our database is quite substantial uh, for a lot of clients. Um, prior diagnosis or treatment for TB diseases or LTBI, as I mentioned. Um, a detailed assessment informs diagnosis of TB. So very important, whatever information you can put on that 939, even if it, you think it looks messy, it's still added information and we do appreciate as much as we can get uh, from that 939 form. Um, results of prior TB testing, screening tests, clients don't always remember that and that's why it just uh, takes a phone call to give us a call. Uh, to give us the, the heads up and we can look it up for you. So BCG vaccine vaccination history. BCG is not a contraindication for TB skin tests and it may or may not affect the TST results. And also pregnancy is not a contraindication for TB skin tests. Pregnant women can have a TB skin test. It is, uh, there is no literature that uh, indicates that it's harmful to the fetus. And it's safe. So they have BCG skin test them. If they have a previous documented skin test. Obviously, we'll we'll go from there. But um, just to because people will, will will go, oh, I have a BCG. I can't get a skin test. We want to make sure that it's documented. And um, with the advent of Panorama, hopefully, we'll all have access to the same clinical system, and it'll make uh, patient care um, just all that better. So when we're doing our TB risk assessments, we want to consider that if the client in front of us is uh, TST negative, especially in a contact uh, tracing situation, we want to consider if they have any comorbidities. Um, so are, do they have concurrent viral infections or bacterial infections? Um, do they have chronic renal failure? 
uh, any diseases affecting the lymphoid organs, such as lymphoma, leukemia, sarcoidosis. Are they taking any immune-suppressing drugs, such as prednisone, imuran, methotrexate? Uh, also, do you have a child under the age of six uh, months in front of you or less, or an elderly patient? Uh, either one of them may have a, an immature or waning uh, immune system. So lots of questions to, to ponder when you're doing your TB risk assessments. But definitely the findings influence the screening pathway in areas for clinical education and for informing the phys physician's decision to treat. So very, very important, the bottom point, incomplete 939 forms cause delays and can interfere with the ability of TB physicians to interpret test results. So really it's important. We're trying to figure out if it's TB or not TB. That's why we're here. And some of the things that will inform our practice is, are there close contacts uh, of a case? Uh, have they been exposed to TB before? What we see in our clinics in, in Vancouver um, and New West is uh, new immigrants who have um, come from high endemic countries, as I said, like China, India, or the Philippines. Um, they will break down within that two to three years because of the stress of moving um, um, into a, a new country like Canada, even as great as a country as Canada, the stressors of moving um, really cause that breakdown of the immune system and, and, and the, the TB germ gets um, loose from the macrophaga and, and breaks down and actually causes damage. Um, obviously we want to look at marginalized populations, homeless um, injection drug use, um, because they may have uh, the social determinants of health that, that we want to make sure that we focus on and also uh, following up may be a challenge, right? So, um, and we wanted to point out on the fifth point, Aboriginal peoples. Uh, being Aboriginal is not a risk factor for breaking down with TB. It's those environments because they have a historical context of, of TB um, in their communities. They have a huge pool of latent TB infections. So most communities that we work fit with and for have latent TB 20 to 30 percent in their communities. So they have a, a pool. It's like you know that, that, that classic uh, iceberg. It's the cases that are the tip that we all focus on, but it's actually that whole pool of latent TB, the bottom of the iceberg that actually you know sunk the Titanic. So because that is also, we just wanted to point that out that being Aboriginal is not a risk factor, but it's all the kind of social determinants of health even within marginalized populations or the populations we work with. So just be mindful. Uh, uh, again, um, who's, who's, who's um, at increased risk for uh, the development um, of TB after you've, you've broken it down? We've talked a little bit about, about this. If you're HIV infected, if you have a low CD4 count, so if you have CD4 count less than 100, you won't have an immune response to the skin test. Um, and um, as well as, um, as well as, um, um, we want to make sure that we treat. The other, the other thing is, um, if you have diabetes, you have a 30% chance of breaking down with disease. Infants uh, younger than, than uh, five have a 40% chance. We're just going to move on to our partners at BC Lung to kind of talking about the smoking piece. Okay, my turn. We can kind of ignore this first slide because I just have a habit of needing to do a title page. So there it is. Oh, it's Veda from the Lung Association. My job title here is Tobacco Education Coordinator. So I'm your smoking trivia person. And I think that it's important that we talk about tuberculosis and TB because the association between the two has been investigated since 1918. It's important to consider when you're looking at the transition from infection to TB disease. It's important to consider the signs and symptoms. It has an association with relapse and mortality rates. And it is a causal risk factor for tuberculosis. So the standard of practice what, that we need to apply to tuberculosis and tobacco, we need to identify those people who do use tobacco and how it might affect their families. It's important in your TB assessment because tobacco has systemic effects that can affect not only the treatment but the severity of disease. You as a health professional have an obligation to give advice in terms of wellness. We need to raise awareness of the tobacco epidemic. 
to be may have been described for thousands of years and tobacco may have been used for not quite as many thousands of years but as an epidemic tobacco has been a problem for about a hundred years and unless we do something about it it's not going to get any better and we need to encourage change and reduce the risks why should you do it patients clients they expect to be asked about their tobacco use and the reality is that if you don't ask about tobacco use they will assume that you approve or at least are accepting of their tobacco use at the time they are admitted to the system they're more receptive to advice and encouragement to make positive changes in their health and if you have a brief intervention they are 17 times more likely to stop smoking than they are if you say nothing so what impact that that does have on your workload? Five to 30 minutes over four sessions. It is personal. Person has to have an interest in change. Obviously, if you ask somebody if they're going to stop smoking and they say not in my lifetime, you're kind of out of luck for saying anything else. But the setting is important as well because you have an opportunity to see them frequently. And it's important that you do follow up at each visit, even if the follow up is just How's your quit going? So what you want to do with that brief intervention, you want to screen, detect the users, find out who uses tobacco, in what way, um, are their families exposed to secondhand smoke, or are they going outside to smoke and then bringing third hand back inside. You want to give them clear advice, not you should quit smoking, but smoking is the number, quitting smoking is the number one thing that you can do to improve your health. And once you give them that information and they start to think about it, then they're likely to be more motivated to change that part of their life. When do you do it? Anytime. On pre-admission to, to the hospital, on your first visit with them for assessment, you of course have to be prepared to deal with withdrawal, so it's not a bad idea to have some NRT on hand. Some people get really antsy if they don't have their cigarettes. And it's generally not that big a deal. So what do you do? You ask, do you use tobacco? Have you thought about quitting? Have you ever tried to quit? Advise them to quit. If they are willing to do so, then offer assistance in the way of NRT or counseling and arrange follow-up. Ask, advise, and assist are bold because if you can't, if you can't find the time, to do assess and arrange it really is important that you ask advise and assist the benefits of doing that stopping smoking is the single most important step that a person can take to improve their health it makes both the patient and the family healthier as I said before they are then more receptive to make other positive changes in their life maybe that's improving the setting in which they are, the environment in which they live or socialize and it also offers perhaps reduced side effects of the medications involved in treating their TB. So what do we do on our next webinar? We talk about the importance of having willing and trained staff to do brief intervention. We're not going to throw you to the wolves. You are a credible source of health information and having them across from you at a desk or in a clinic is a teachable moment. We'll give you the necessary skills and tools to do a brief intervention and one of the things that we have to look at and have a little more work to do is improving the infrastructure that's involved in including tobacco therapy and cessation in treating TB. It needs to be standard practice because it is so prevalent. If a third of the population of the world is infected with TB and 20% of the world smokes, there's a pretty good correlation to the populations that are at risk for TB infection and the populations that we see higher smoking rates, like Aboriginals, HIV infection, the homeless, people with social issues. And it needs to be on in the monitoring process and it needs to be on that 939, which sounds like it's already fairly crowded. <laughs> All right, and <clears throat> thank you. Um, so why would kind of put that in? Obviously, it's a partnership with BC Lung. We're also really interested in, in um, people are not um, 
it's not just looking at one thing, it's looking at the whole person. So what other programs have done as well is working with the smoking cessation and, and, um, and tobacco is also looking at diabetes and looking at other programming. So it's really, um, you know, backhanding on each other and, and supporting the work that we do because the client is there. Um, so again, tip number five, getting back to TB and HIV. Uh, TB, um, HIV is the single largest risk factor if you have latent TB infection um, and um, uh, for breaking down with TB. So if you have a patient that's identified as having active TB disease, test for HIV. If you have a patient that has, has um, um, HIV, a test for TB. So they're double trouble, we just say. So when testing for TB infection, the first thing that we do is are your TB skin test. So in most people who have TB infection, the immune system will recognize the uh, PPD because it's extracted from the tubercle bacilli that causes the infection. Um, so that's your very first test. In a contact situation, it is free. Uh, contacts do not need to uh, pay for the cost of the TST. And I actually just had a phone call from uh, uh, a teacher that was telling me that he was in contact with a new active TB case in Bangladesh. So when they walk in and they tell me this, I'm going to test them free of charge. There is no charge in circumstances like this. And so uh, the other test for latent TB infection is the interferon gamma release assay. It's a blood test. Um, it is uh, limited in terms of because it's not covered under MSP and there's a cost. Uh, TB control doctors are actually recommending it and you have to go to either Prince George, Kelowna, Vancouver, Vancouver Island, um, or New West, and um, and so that is a limiter. Hopefully, uh, in the next little while, that will open up and, and people will have access. So, for development of immune response, um, typically PPD produces a T cell mediated delayed delayed type hypersensitivity reaction if the person's been infected with the MTB uh, bacilli. But it takes three to eight weeks after initial infection with the MTB for the immune system to be able to react to the PPD and for the infection to be detected by the TST. So in some people who are infected with uh, MTB, the ability to react to the PPD may wane over the years. So when those people receive TST many years after infection, they may have an initial negative reaction. This is why we ask for a baseline TST with an eight-week follow-up after the last date of contact. So remember that the, the skin test is an immune response, and so um, we'll take a look at that. And so this next slide just talks about the, um, the TST itself, the PPD. Um, in, interpretation of TST reaction depends on the measurement in millimeters of the induration and the person's risk of acquiring the TB infection or the risk of progression to TB disease if they are infected. So reaction size must be interpreted in the clinical context. So what else is going on with them? Um, uh, just to let you know that the blood test, what we do now and what the recommendations are in BC is if they have had a BCG, if they had a positive skin test, they have a negative x-ray because the um, TST and the, um, the blood test are looking at a latent TB infection. So we want to make sure that that process is happening. And, and to let you know that the T spot, there are two type of uh, blood work. Uh, the the quantiferon gold, um, pretty much the standard, it's fairly sensitive. Um, it'll, it'll give you an idea whether that person ha has latent TB infection outside of the BCG because they look at different TB antigens secreted early on. The T-spot is used for people who are immunosuppressed. That is only available in Vancouver and New West. So, and remember that the results are interpreted, uh, again, in, in a clinical context. And currently, with every single IGRA, the physicians are actually going to give you a recommendation and a documentation on that. And um, that may change once IGRA opens up. So as, we, as we've um, stated that TSTs and IGRAs are are only to determine whether the person has latent TB infection. And AGRA, within the process, they get a TST, they're positive, they get an x-ray, we go, hey, is it is the TST due to B BCG or is it due to um, latent TB infection? Okay, why don't you get the blood test? Um, and so that's the rationale. So our testing for TB disease includes um, chest x-rays, CT scans, laboratory testing such as TSTs, IGRAs, Sputum is our best tool for diagnosing pulmonary TB. It's also good for diagnosing MOT or MAC cases. 
Um, if you take a look at the next of oh, this film, um, this slide, um, it's chest radiography or chest x-rays. Uh, typical findings such as cavities or infiltrates can be absent. Uh, atypical features are more common in young children and those with immune compromising conditions such as lowered CD4 counts. Uh, a chest x-ray in a child is different from that of an adult. Chest x-ray in an immune competent adult is different from a chest x-ray in an immune compromised individual. So that was kind of a slide kind of, we're going to read um, the, uh, the chest x-rays at TB Control. They looked at a lot so they'll be able to, they, they, they see TB. Uh, these are some indicators for the chest x-ray. Obviously, if somebody has signs and symptoms of tuberculosis, if they are new positive or, um, and then uh, obviously um, have their chest x-ray, then we do uh, agar like I talked to, previous positive. Um, so um, what's really important here and what we want to stress is, yes, you've given them, you've got clinical implant, um, you've decided that they want to, that you need an x-ray. You've sent them for an x-ray. You sent us the 939. Let us know where they've gone. Uh, so what a lot of our clerical staff spend a lot of time doing is looking for which radiologist they've gone to see, where they've gone, um, and that if we know where they've gone, it expedites the process. So um, just within the slide, I just want to focus uh, in our manual. It is actually the second trimester, um, so just make a note of that. Um, here it says first trimester of pregnancy. It's actually the second, so um, we would um, it's counterindicated. Um, to, so we would... Un Unshield chest x-rays for TB screenings is uh, contraindicated for asymptomatic women who are um, or may be pregnant with child. So we'll wait until the second tri trimester. So this next film shows you two different chest x-rays. The one on the left-hand side is uh, posterior anterior, um, with pulmonary TB being the most common form of TB disease. Uh, the chest x-ray is useful for diagnosing TB disease. Um, so the one on the left is your standard uh, view used for detecting TB disease. Uh, and abnormalities, and the one on the right, in some cases we ask for those to be done, especially in children. A lateral view may be helpful and is recommended in children and in some immune suppressed clients. So again, here's a lovely 939. We've, I think, stressed that enough. Make sure that you fill it and you send it to us and you let us know what's going on. It gives us the picture. Get it? X-ray picture, 939. So this again on your left is a normal X-ray. I'm not a radiologist, but I'm saying that's a normal x-ray. And if you look at the right x-ray, it actually has some consolidation on the, up, uh, on the upper left lobe. And that's kind of the language that you'll see. So just so you get familiar with some of the language. And so that definitely is some cavitary uh, disease. And so for this slide, left uh, chest x-ray film is the normal. And the one on the right-hand side shows consolidation for pleural TB. And if you take a look, it actually looks like the space underneath the lung is pushing up on the lung. Miliary TB disease, the one on the left is normal, and the one on the right looks like it's got a whole bunch of dots, almost like raindrops, but it actually uh, resembles millet seed in appearance. That's why we call it miliary TB. So chest radiography can't, be, can't provide conclusive diagnosis diagnosis on its own and should be followed by laboratory tests for TB disease, the most significant for pulmonary being your sputum specimen collection or bronchoscopy if they are unable to prove sputum specimens. So again, it's a piece of the puzzle, right? We want to make sure that we, um, well, we, we look at all those kinds of indicators that we've talked about. So for lab testing, this is a list of the types of testing we do, um, AFB smear, uh, PCR, uh, mycobacterial culture, species identification, drugs, DSTs or drug susceptibility testing, DNA fingerprinting, and histopathology, particularly tissue and bone specimens. Um, so specimens, just this is very important. Specimens will not be examined for TB unless these tests are specified on the laboratory requisitions. So think TB, check for TB. When you're filling out your requisitions, please make sure that you're asking for the specific test. There is a box that says sputum. In the little part that says clinical history, please put AFB, sputum for AFB, and a small amount of history is helpful to the lab. Yeah, and we just want to reinforce it here that we really uh, rely on your clinical judgment uh, to get three sputums. Um, 
And what we would actually recommend that bird in hand, if the client is there, get a stat sputum. Um, there is a YouTube video that is on the um, on this particular slide. Uh, take a look at it. It's a great um, educational um, resource for you and your patients. So specimens should be labeled with the date of collection, two identifiers, meaning name and date of birth. For the name, please include complete first and last names, no initials. And if the specimens are missing any of these identifiers or the identifiers don't match the bottle to the specimen uh, requisition, the lab cannot be processing that uh, sample for us. It sounds like a no-brainer, but we see samples all the time that cannot be processed because we unfortunately didn't provide them with the name, a date of birth, um, and you know a PHN or something, and they couldn't match, or the label was different from the the lab rack. So you'd be surprised how many uh, samples we have to toss out. So quality of specimen is significant because it, it, uh, the accuracy of the laboratory result, result relies on submission of a high quality specimen. So basically, this lovely sputum specimen. I hope everybody's had lunch already. Yeah, we basically want the horker guys. That's really important. <laughs> um, and so we're going to go continue here. We're almost end to coming to the end of uh, our lovely presentation. You'll have some time for questions, just in this particular slide, stat doesn't mean um, the stat that you're getting that that sputum um, uh, from the from the client. It's actually how they set it up in the lab. It's a lab process, and just so you know, when you see that on a lab rat, that the it's unconcentrated and it may lead to 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 falsely negative. It's just quicker, especially when we want a quicker turnaround. Um, so for when we're assessing the AFB smears, um, when an AFB is seen, they're counted, and this is the system for reporting them. So the, um, the higher the AFB count at the time of diagnosis, the more infectious the rate. So on the left-hand side, the grading system, negative is no AFB. A few means weakly infectious. One and two plus means moderately infectious. And three and four plus means um, strongly positive uh, and very infectious. So it's just how many bacilli you're putting in the air. And it gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, in terms of this particular slide, it's the gold standard. It's what we use to diagnose cases of TB. Just so you know that uh, once we get the smear, uh, we put it on a slide, we take a look at it, we say whether it's TB or not TB, and then we grow it. We put it into two. A solid medium is in the picture there, or a liquid medium, and it can take up to six to eight weeks. So it does take time. There are times where it comes back sooner because there's lots of bacteria. So for species identification, um, a species cannot be identified if there is no culture. If there's no culture, it means we didn't have an adequate specimen. So this helps to guide treatment uh, while drug sensitivity tests are pending. And a little note in here that Mbofus is PZA resistant. Um, so the DST requires a positive culture, so MTB isolate is uh, tested for resistance to first-line anti-TB drugs, and so these results direct the physician and practitioner to choose the appropriate drugs for treating each of our clients. So patients with the TB disease who are treated with the drugs to which their strain of TB is resistant may not successfully be cured, and that's a, a very important factor to know. Uh, in fact, their TB strain can become resistant to additional drugs as well, so you're getting into your MDR and the or XDR uh, TB. The additional thing that we can provide, um, what we do is with um, active cases of TB disease, um, uh, we need the, uh, again, the positive cultures to do the DNA fingerprinting or the MIRUs, the genotyping, and that certainly we use that for surveillance um, for, to identify clusters to look at what's going on in the picture. So we can currently do that for all cases of um, active TB disease. And what you'll see again in your reporting is a MIRU report and the physician will go, this is a match to the Kelowna outbreak or this is a match to something. And so that informs our practice. Um, and just so you know that that's another piece that, just the value added about being a uh, centralized uh, program. So biopsies or clinical specimens can be examined for uh, findings common to TB disease. However, if a specimen is fixed in formalin, it will not grow in a culture medium. Uh, and so we encourage additional material to be collected and sent for AFB smear and mycobacterial culture when possible. All right. So the next webinar will be October 4th, and it's going to be talking about actually treating the latent TB and active.
uh, latent TB infection and active TB disease. So we're hoping that now you know the difference between latent TB infection and active TB disease. You know that TST, AGRAs, X-rays um, are your uh, weapons against TB and the speedum is, um, we love it. Questions? C concerns? So we have a question here that says, would uh, would be great to have that slide TB latent versus active TB for our office. We actually have um, um, those kinds of things and we actually might put it in a, in a laminated poster so we can certainly make that available. Please contact one of our TB nurses um, in any of the programs and we'll make sure that we make that available. Um, and we can certainly put that online um, um, or make that um, accessible through um, the webinar. And so there's another question here which, um, oh, let's see, sorry, uh, okay. Are there, are there plans to include tobacco use on the Health 939? So the, pre so. yeah, previously we did have smoking on the Health 939 and we went, some, uh, we went to some revisions. What we're looking at is actually um, uh, trying to really promote that smoking cessation, also diabetes programming, anything that would help support it, we're trying to get that back in. It's the real estate space and um, we will try to do that in our next version because that, like you said, that does help. Any other uh, questions? We're yes. just going to go down. Yeah. Excellent. Can you explain the speed and probe? <clears throat> so what happens is you um, get that client to do that nice little horker. Um, they, they, you send it to the lab because you've done the correct process, you've labeled it, you've labeled the, the requisition. It comes to TB control and it goes upstairs to the lab. They actually smear it. They put it on a plate, they look at it, and they see bacteria. They're like, oh, there's some bacteria in there. What is it? What we care about, is it TB or is it not TB? So they will do this uh, pulmonary test that will actually tell us if it's TB or not TB. And what you'll get, what you'll see is it's pro-positive for M tuberculosis, and then we'll we'll go ahead and treat, um, and then we'll get the cultures, and so we'll get. Oh, or what happens is sometimes um, it's probe negative, um, and we send in another sample. There wasn't a lot of TB in it, um, and it'll grow out a mat or some, a mot or mac. Um, so uh, that's the probe. It'll actually. Um, They'll, they'll actually probe it to see if that bacteria is M tuberculosis. Once in a while there isn't enough of the um, microbacteria to probe and sometimes that specimen will actually culture out MTB yeah. whereas the probe was negative. So there is always that component. Even if something says it's uh, probe negative, we don't know for sure if it's not TB until we get the culture report. And why we really like that probe every day, we want to know if they're infectious. Mm -hmm. Right, so if they're plus one, plus two, plus three, and we're like, is it TB, is it not TB, and it's probe negative, we know that we're not worried about infection now. So what happens, like um, Lynn has said, six to eight weeks, that culture grows back, and it's grown TB. So we know now to go back and, and get some more speed ups. So there's a question here, it says, chest x-rays, uh, info slide referred to detox admission. We are just using TB skin tests for detox admission. Can we comment? And so within the guidelines of um, uh, TB in, uh, in BC and within the detox, if you have a previous positive skin test, you're not going to be able to skin test, obviously, because they're positive. So they need a chest x-ray within the calendar year to clear them for x-ray. Within, um, within approximately six months to a year uh, for x-ray. But if they have a positive, uh, when you're planting the TB skin test, if it's negative, they don't need a chest x-ray unless they're symptomatic, in which case you would do your chest x-ray and your sputum collection. But if they're TST negative with no symptoms, no prior history of TB or, or uh, positive uh, TST, then that's all you need. You don't need a chest x-ray on top of that. And so um, uh, are there treatment centers that do uh, TB beads. In Squamish, we find that many people who wish to enter detox get a skin test uh, but never um, come back for the reads. And that's true, and, and that may be a barrier for them to get uh, treated, but they, may, they need that negative skin test. So, um, you know, there are some residential treatment centers that do read skin tests because they have nursing. Um, so in the downtown east side, you know, Cordova detox, um, because they're wanting to make sure that that's not a barrier, 
they're going to read those skin tests. They sometimes even plant them there. Um, they'd certainly do that up at, upstairs at Insight as well, given the population and the risk factors and it kind of a determines uh, the social determinants of health. So it's not across the board. So you'd have to find out in your health regions what's going on. So the question is, how can those who miss the this presentation access this uh, this one? Great question, by the way. We have actually recorded this, and you'll be able to hear Lynn and I just talk endlessly and rewind it forward, and I know it's exciting. So it will actually be hopefully recorded and, and um, be available to you. It is recorded. Uh, men at BC Lung is saying it's recorded, so not to worry. And so um, if you've completed six months of latent TB prophylaxis medication, would you still test positive for, for a TB skin test? Really important to know, and at, uh, for in Canada, uh, latent TB uh, treatment is nine months unless you're using rifampin, which is six months. Uh, the skin test, because it's, um, sorry, thank you, Lynn. Um, rifampin is four months, INH is nine months, um, and because it's an immune response, it doesn't detect. So you got to remember why that what the TST does. It actually the because remember how that you breathe in a TB germ, your macrophagium surrounds it and it creates, you know, walls it off. So you give them a skin test, it's got uh, some of that TB um, antigens in there, it's, it builds out an immune response, it goes to surround it, very much like it would the TB germ. And that's what creates the induration. So it's just recognize it that it's seen before. So they may, it, it, they may have a positive skin test because it, it's just your immune system seeing if it's seen it. Do you have anything to add, Lynn? Um, no. No. So hopefully that um, asks, answers the question. If possible, is it, to, is it possible to breathe TB bacteria and not develop latent or active TB? Great question. Um, it is actually. Uh, it is possible to breathe it in. Some people just actually um, pass it. Um, some people's immune system just pass it and, 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 and that happens. Um, so a good question. Is it possible? Uh, oh, AGRA. How much does AGRA's cost? So currently, um, the uh, Quantiferon Gold costs about 60, 70 bucks. The uh, T-Spot costs a hundred um, uh, dollars, and so that's not including the processing. So that then um, specimen has to be transported to BCCBC, and then we we um, process it. It's an expensive test. It's it's a very good test. So we're hoping to advocate to make sure that it's accessible across the board because if we can provide that service and that information and somebody doesn't have to get on toxic medications because the antibiotics are fairly toxic um, and they don't have latent TB infection, you've already, right off the bat, you don't have to give them the INH or the, or the Rifaltin. And so, is that my question relates to supporting clients in their decision about whether or not to initiate treatment in the case of recent latent, latent TB diagnosis. Uh, a 45-year-old healthy, I assume non-symptomatic person is, is presenting to you. And so it's a great question and that's why we want to make sure that you give them that informed decision. Um, do they have diabetes? Are they on TNF inhibitors? What are their risk factors of breaking down? And so when we talked about it, if they've been in contact with somebody in their lifetime or at that point, let's say they're contact, they have that 5% chance. Over their lifetime, they have another 5%. So 10% chance. All else being equal, you know, they can make that decision. Um, if something happens, then obviously they, in, they have an increased risk factor. I always stress to a client uh, two things. Number one is even if they refuse to do latent TB infection treatment at this point in time, it will always be available to them should they decide to do it in the future. The second thing is I think people need to understand that as we age, regardless of our age at the current time when you're discussing this with your client, our immune systems do co become compromised at some point in time. So the, the lower your immune system uh, is functioning, the higher the risk for developing TB in your senior years, unfortunately. So I always make them aware of that. So yeah, maybe this is the great time for this person to get onto treatment because He's not on anything. He's doing really well. I think we've got one more question, and then um, we're at 1 o'clock. I'm mindful of your time. Please uh, feel free to phone us at TV Control if there's anything uh, that we haven't answered or um, um, you need clarification for. Uh, if a client had a BCG, will the TST always be positive? 
no, the TST will not always be positive because, again, it's, you've got to remember what the TST is, an immune response. And your memory cells or your T4, they'll wane and, or they'll forget. Um, they're very much like me. Um, if, if, it's, if I'm there, I'm in there, I'm in the moment, I'm going to remember it. So if they had an exposure fairly recent, your immune system is going to build a response. If it's been a while, it may not. The important thing to know that um, BCG is not a very good vaccine. It's not going to stop you from breathing in the TB germ. So I'm going to wrap it up. One more question, really. What are, the, what are immigrants required to do uh, in relation to TB upon entry into Canada? Um, that all depends on the history from the country of origin. If the country of origin has identified that the individual has had previous TB, TB exposure, abnormal uh, radiological exams, uh, TB treatment, uh, then they will further that information to CIC, Canada Immigration, something or other, I can't remember the last word of it, uh, and request that these individuals uh, be tested in Canada. Uh, so it's all up to CIC to determine um, whether or not these individuals need to go through testing here in Canada, uh, and that is all generated from the country of origin. Um, there are many questions online. We are going to answer them offline. We know that you guys are very busy and TB is not the only part of your job. So thank you very much for joining us. Please let your friends and family and coworkers know that our next workshop uh, or webinar, sorry, is October 4th and it's going to be on the treatment of latent TB on the active uh, TB disease and we'll go through medications and signs and symptoms. Yet another exciting afternoon. Have Thanks. a great weekend, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Mm -hmm. Good.